Hi everybody, I'm Scott Stanchfield and today we're going to talk about the composite pattern and the visitor pattern. Now if you haven't been in any of these lectures before, I do record them all and they're all at javadude.com slash articles slash patterns. Uh, the videos you can download them, watch them, whatever, uh, as well as the source code that I have for each of these. So first of all, Let's talk about a data structure. Let's say we had a heterogeneous tree of data. And by heterogeneous, I mean each of the nodes can be different types. They're typically related. And in particular, for the composite pattern, they're all going to have some kind of common base class. Um, but each of the nodes are going to be different types. And we may want to do different things with these nodes as we walk through them. Now, last time we talked about the iterator pattern, which is a way to contain the movement through a data structure. In this case, we're going to assume the data structure manages itself as far as moving through. Now, it doesn't have to be a tree, but for the example here, that's a pretty useful example. You could have some other kind of graph. As long as you have some way of walking it internally, the composite pattern will, will apply. Now, in this particular case, I've set up a class hierarchy that looks kind of like the following. We're starting at a top level called employee. And this is an abstract class that represents some employee working for a company. And then we have a guy called a composite employee. Again, another abstract class. What this guy does is he is an employee who contains other employees. So he's somebody who can have minions, basically. Under composite employee, we have manager, CEO, and VP. Those are concrete classes, and we're actually using them in this structure. And we have a worker who is just a base employee, so he's not a composite. So let's think about different scenarios that we might do with the CEO here. We might ask the CEO to write a report. This, in this quarterly report, we're going to go to the CEO and ask him to write the report. Now, is he going to write the whole report? Very, very unlikely, right? What he's going to do is he's going to delegate to his minions and aggregate the results and maybe add some more stuff of his own inside that. Maybe you know, the message from the CEO or something. So if we think about this, where the CEO delegates to his VPs, he tells them to write a report. The VPs delegate to their managers, telling them to write the report. The managers delegate to their workers, telling them to write the report. And they actually do some work. And then the managers aggregate the results. The VPs aggregate those results, and the CEO aggregates those results. So we have this kind of recursive descent down through our hierarchy here, asking the people at the leaves to probably do most of the work. And that follows up, and the people in the middle, they may add their own work, or they may simply just aggregate the results. <clears throat> this looks like if we have this hierarchy here, we call write report on the CEO, assuming that's a method. He calls write report on the VPs. He, they call write report on their managers. They call write report on their workers. Pretty straightforward, right? In the composite pattern, each node does some work, delegates to children if they have it, and then aggregates their child result. Now, it doesn't mean that they have to simply just collect the results. They could be putting stuff before. They could be putting stuff after. They could be adding data to send down to those delegates, maybe to give them a little bit more focus to, to what they're going to be doing. But that's kind of the basic structure there. Um, let me go ahead and show the example. I thought I had a little flag in there to say show the example, but apparently I didn't. So we're going to start off with definition of an employee. Is that font size OK? I can bump it up if anybody has any issues. OK, so I have a definition of an employee here. He just has a name. You can get the name. And he has that abstract right report. Here's our composite employee. And our composite employee extends employee. And he's going to have a list of minions that he keeps track of. Just a constructor that passes through to the superclass so we can get the name in there. And he has a way of getting the minions and adding to his minions. Now, in this particular case, I'm just returning this just so I can have kind of a little fluent API on when I'm structuring this. Just makes the, uh, the application a little bit easier to write, a little more visual. Now, the write report for a composite employee is going to say, for each of my minions, I want to gather up what they have and concatenate it. Now, I'm using Java streams here to write this. So I'm going to say, walk through each of the minions. In order to generate a value for that minion, I'm going to call write report on the minion. Once I have all those individual reports, I'm going to reduce them into a single string. I do that by pairwise walking through the list. I start with the first element. It's going to become so far. And the second element is going to be my report. I concatenate them. That then becomes so far, and then is worked against the next element. So it basically walks it way, its way down through the entire stream, concatenating them all together into one long string. Uh, at the end of this, we're going to return 
the result string, or if there wasn't anything, so there are no minions, will return just no minions. And that's roughly equivalent to this non-stream st uh, mess here that says, if my minions is empty, return no minions, otherwise for each minion concatenate. Make sense? Now, the specifics here. CEO, he's a composite employee, and he has a little write report method that says his name, telling people you're holding it wrong, so it's Steve Jobs in other words, and we're just going to concatenate in what the superclass does for us. That's all the, the minion work. We have our VP, very, very similar, except he's just going to say vicing stuff. We have our manager. He's going to say managing stuff, same type of thing. And then we have our worker that's actually going to do the real data. Note that he's not calling any type of superclass method to do this because he doesn't have a superclass method that's concrete. He's just going to say real data and stuff with the name in there. And I'm just passing in a little indent string that at each level I increase the indent so that we can actually see things printed out a little bit more nicely. Finally, here's an application. And this is that little Fluent API I was talking about where each level return, when you say add, it returns the thing itself. So I'm going to create... Steve-O at the top, add in Mike and Sue as VPs. Mike has the cat as a manager who has thing one, thing two, thing three. He has Melissa as a manager who has the beeb and the beeve. And Sue has Martin and the mouse as managers. Martin has Charlie and Emilio as, as the minions, and the mouse has Brittany, Justin, and Annette. Once we've got all those, we've got our structure together. We're just going to call CEO write report, and I'm just passing in no indent to start with. That should generate my report and then print it out. So let's take a look at this guy. And there we go. So we see that the structure ended up creating this one report, which includes everybody's aggregation moving up the chain. Make sense? So this is the basic idea of the composite pattern. It's a fairly simple pattern. We're letting the data structure do the walking and do the definition of what to do. OK, so far. Now, there's a couple of problems with this. First of all, we're defining one true way to do some unit of work. And this is something I really don't like. A lot of people are push very strongly that the data should actually do the work itself. Um, I'm not a fan of that approach. I like to have my data very separate from my uh, uh, the what to do with the data. And that allows me to have many different ways of doing things. If we want different work in this approach, we have to add new methods for each type of work we have. Not necessarily an ideal situation. The hardcore OO purists are like, oh yeah, that's the right way to do things. It's like this is known as the law of Demeter. The objects keep all their data to themselves and they do everything for themselves and nobody else is allowed to mess with their data. Simplest way to describe a law of Demeter is you should never have more than one dot between uh, two objects. If you say dot get something, dot do something on it, you're wrong. That's what law of Demeter is against. Um, I'm not a fan of that. In pure object-oriented programming from the very start, let's think about where it came from. Anyone happen to know where it came from? We had a language called Simula 67, written uh, back in 1967. And uh, these are a couple of folks from Oslo. And they designed this language. And with a language name like that, what do you think it was designed for? Simulation. Okay. This is for discrete event simulation is what they were doing in specific here. And for simulation, I, I think, let me say one more time, simulation. <laughs> simulation is really, really good at modeling something real if you use law of Demeter or if you're very restrictive on things. If you take OO and you take the concept of very strict data hiding where nobody else can know what you're doing. That's perfect for simulation. And it represents the real world. Okay. But it's really, really inflexible. How many simulation programs do you write? Some people do, but most of our programming, you know, at least what I do, I do a lot of web programming, I do a lot of Android programming. These are not simulations. I'm programming so the computer does something for you. I'm not programming so the computer pretends to be something so I can see how things would work out. And for simulation, I totally say, yeah, do your strict data hiding and things like that. Let me talk about encapsulation for a second while I'm here, because I always like to talk about encapsulation. What does encapsulation mean? So a class holds its own data. That's part of it. 
Sometimes people talk about it as data hiding. That's like one of the most common terms you're going to hear. Other classes don't know, nor do they have access to your data. That's one way of looking at it. I tend to look at it as data protection. And let me give you a little example from, from real life that happened to me. I, I was uh, back in the late 90s, I was in London teaching a class. And uh, when I was done teaching my class, I went into the city to, to go and do some shopping. I happened to go to Harrods, and it, which is like this huge crowd of people going in, crowd of people coming out. And you know, you're basically mashed up with all these people waddling into the store. You do your shopping, and then when you come out, you're mashed up with all these people on the sidewalk waddling going down the street. So after I was done at Harrods, I decided to go to McDonald's. Now, I went to McDonald's in London for one reason. They had fried apple pies. We don't have fried apple pies here anymore. We just have those stupid baked ones because, oh yeah, health. Uh, so I wanted to get my fried apple pie. I go to the counter. I order Big Mac, fried apple pie, and uh, Diet Coke. Reach for my wallet, and it's not there. Now, the immediate concern I had is, damn it, I'm not going to be able to get my apple pie which is what I really want. I was frothing at the mouth for this thing. I'm like, oh my God, they have fried apple pies. I'm so happy. And uh, I couldn't get my apple pie. I didn't have my wallet. Now, the problem here to me, the core problem was I didn't know that I didn't have my wallet until it came to that spot. Because if I knew I didn't have my wallet, I wouldn't have made, done an order. I wouldn't have been salivating. So what would have been nice is for whoever picked my pocket to have asked me for my wallet. And then I could give it to them. And what's really nice, and if you notice right now, my wallet's in my front pocket. It's a little easier to control now. It would have been nice if somebody would walk up to me and say, pardon me, may I have your wallet? And now it's my choice to give it to them or not. And on top of that, I know my state. And that's really the key with encapsulation is you want to keep track of your own state and know your state. Now, they may have parameterized that method, like maybe the parameter is do they have a gun or not, in which case I might give a different response. But in either case, I know my state, whether I've given them the wallet or not. And that's key to any type of object-oriented programming. You want to control your data. You want to know what your state is at all times. Because if somebody can just reach in and tweak things like they did, they just reached in and grabbed my wallet and I didn't know it, then your processing is going to go ahead down a path that you might not be able to complete. You're in an inconsistent state. So data protection is really, in my opinion, what that's all about. So definitely have data protection. If you're doing simulation, take it to the next level. Take it to data hiding. So, oh, there was the composite example one. I had that slide in the wrong spot. Oops. Okay, anyway, so you've seen that first example. Now, we can make this more flexible by sticking a strategy in the mix. Now, was anybody here for the talk on strategy? Okay, strategy and template method. Strategy is basically an object that we're going to pass in to do something for us. So instead of having the, the object that's actually being worked on have the do something inside of it, we just pass that in from the outside. The data structure is still going to manage my walk, and we can think of that as a template method. So it's going to have the logic for walking through, but when it comes time to actually do something, it calls the strategy. That's the hook for the, for the uh, template method. So let's take a look at the next step in this. And where did I go here? There we go. So our employee is still going to look exactly the same. Our composite employee actually he still looks exactly the same too. He's calling uh, write report on the minions. So now let's take a look at the explicit what we're doing at each level. Oh, because I'm looking in the wrong package. That's why everything's exactly the same. Let me try looking at the different package here, shall we? So I was wondering, it's like, I know I changed this. So employee, I've tweaked things slightly here. Instead of having a write report method, I now have a use processor method. So I've gotten a little more generic on the name. And I'm going to pass in something called an employee processor. Let's look at him. He just has a single method, process employee. This is my strategy. Anybody can pass in a different strategy if they'd like to, which says, how do I process that employee? And I have at the composite employee method, 
very similar. I have use processor. And he's just going to walk through the minions and call use processor. So he's actually gotten a little simpler. He doesn't have to deal with the concatenation and all that. So here's our employee processor. Let's look at a concrete example of that. I'm going to call it report processor. Now this report processor keeps track of the report that I'm generating. And then when I'm processing employees, he's just going to take a look at the type of the employee and generate something based on the type of employee I'm interested in. So this is one approach that I can use for this. I'm going to start off with the name colon. I'm going to put in the text that I was using before. And then I'm going to put a new line. When, when I'm done with this, I can ask my processor for my report. Everybody else stays the same. So let's take a look at my app on this. He changes just slightly. Set up my data. I'm going to create an instance of my report processor, call use processor, passing it in. That's going to walk it down the hierarchy, passing it to everybody there. And then I'm going to call report processor get report and print that out. So if I run this guy, I see the same type of result. Now you'll notice we're missing the indentation here because I didn't work the indentation in the example, but it's the exact same order of everything that was following in this report generation. Question so far? So the question is, aren't we still doing the same thing, just separating it someplace else? Yes, and that's the exact point. Because now I can actually pass in different processors. So right now I actually have implemented the exact same thing, but I could create a new type of employee processor. Maybe it is for firing everybody in the company. And this would follow down through there and just say, you're fired, you're fired, you're fired, you're fired on everybody. And it would work just as easily as this. And let's just do that real quick. Let's fire everybody. So let's say uh, new class, firing processor. And we can say he is an employee processor. It's sad that that's the first example that came to the top of my head. And I'm just going to say here, employee.getName plus colon, you're fired. This is the Donald Trump processor. And so now what we're going to do is in my app, I'm going to say a firing processor. And note that I'm not actually collecting any data here. I don't have anything to print out there. I'm just going to go ahead and do that. And now when we run this thing, boom, everybody gets fired. So this is really where you start to see the advantage of this, is that you can now pass in different ways of doing things. I didn't have to modify any of the data structure. I'm just passing in a new processor. It could do anything I want it to do. Make sense? Okay. And so... I'll go ahead and just check that in. Oops, I can't, can't push it right now because I'm not connected. So back over to our slides here. So the advantage we get is we can easily add new things to do at any point here. We don't need to go and change our data classes. Why is changing a data class a problem? What's that? One thing is we can mess somebody else up really easily, right? Somebody else may be depending on the API for that class. What else is another problem? Whenever you change something, what can happen? You could, have, you could introduce new side effects, right? In particular, you could introduce bugs, which is always a bad thing, especially if you have a common data structure that's been solid and working. If you modify it, there's a chance of breaking it. So in this particular example, we need to go and change all the types, putting that method in everywhere. Okay. Someone else could depend on the API, as you said. Maybe we don't own the classes. Maybe we can't change them. Maybe this is a third-party library that's come in. And this is one of the cases where if you're developing a library, implementing a composite with a strategy or later on a visitor or something like that gives the flexibility to a third party to introduce new functionality, as opposed to if you locked it down, they can't change it. The best they might hope to is maybe you gave them source code and they can go ahead and make the tweaks in the source and make a fork of your stuff. 
So, problem with this approach. Big ol' if statement I had in there, right? And it has, has to be specific of which classes I'm using inside there. That's not very flexible. I mean, at least we've moved it out of the data structure, but that's still not terribly flexible. What if we thought about using a map of strategies? So maybe instead of having that little if statement inside there, we'd put a map inside that report processor that has strategy object for each individual class. And then it's keyed in that map by the, the uh, strategies. This is really cool because it allows you to register handlers from anywhere. You could even change those at runtime. So maybe as your application's running, you change the way the processing works. That could be kind of neat. And you can take it a step further. Let's say you have some kind of container that's managing a bunch of code. You drop in a new jar for this container that introduces classes CEO, VP, those two different classes there. And you introduce handlers for those guys on what to do. Maybe somebody else throws a new jar in, adds two new data types that you might be putting into your data structure. And he has handlers. Maybe somebody else adds in another jar, and they have handlers. You can mix and match these things. Now, this isn't saying that the handler has to be in the same jar as the data classes. You could have somebody put a jar in that introduces data classes, and then I come in and drop my own jar in that talks about how to handle those data classes. It gives you a lot of flexibility to mix and match what type of data you're using on a server. And you can extend your model very easily. Let's say that I wanted to at some point say managers not only manage workers, maybe they manage um, non-workers. <laughs> maybe there's somebody who actually doesn't do any work. It's a dead weight person that we want to introduce into the system. Isn't that the manager? It, it could be the manager. It depends. I mean, it was when you were one. This is Osama. He was my manager a while back. So, <laughs> Yeah, your optimization techniques just don't do anything. Yeah, Just let Scott do everything. It's easy that way, right? Um, but you can mix and match these things, and that's really what the advantage is, and you can extend the data on this. And we'll see a little bit of an example of this at the very end of this. Because I didn't, I wasn't, at this point, I wasn't thinking of doing an example. And then when I got to actually doing the examples, I'm like, you know, I might as well, but I did it in the wrong order. So let's go way back in time for a minute here. Late 90s, way back in time. This is when design patterns really started becoming a big thing. And when the design pattern book came out. C++ was kind of the big language at that point. I was working for a C++ compiler company. I was actually on the ANSI, ANSI C++ committee at that point. Don't blame me for C++ standard. It wasn't my fault. I tried to stop it. I said no with comments. Um, C++ didn't have any type of runtime type identification. Now, you notice in our if example with the if statement there, I was checking to see what type is everything. C++ didn't let you do that. So your choices where you could use a type code, so put a little field inside your class to say, what type am I? And then have a set of enumeration values or a set of constants that said what you are. But oh, oh, purists, ooh, did they hate this idea. They were like, why? An object knows what it is. We should just use method overloading and all this other fun stuff to take advantage of the way OO works. It's pure, it's simple. And that caused them to think a little too much. They started thinking about how can I determine what is an object at this point? I have no runtime type identification. And so they started thinking about, okay, an object knows its own type, right? If we pass this, this is statically typed to be whatever type the object is, right? So if we call an overloaded method passing in this, the proper overloaded method should be called based on the type. That sounds pretty reasonable. I mean, to me, it's a little bit more indirection than you really should care about, but it's one way of determining what an object is and calling the appropriate logic for it. So take, for example, if we did this, we're going to set up a bunch of static methods here. I'm going to say foo taking a manager, foo taking a VP, and then in each one of my classes in the hierarchy, I'm going to create a test overload method that just turns back to this guy here, the overload test, calling foo, passing in this, just to see what gets called. Okay. I'm going to start by doing this just in employee. So the only class that's going to change is employee. Let me come over here. So in employee, I've added in this test overload. It calls overload test foo. 
Let's look at overload test. He has all those foo methods. And all I'm doing is just printing out what got called. Now my main for my overload test is just going to create each of these objects and call test overload. What am I going to see? Any ideas? Okay, so you're saying I should see worker called, then VP called, then manager called, then CEO called. Sound reasonable? Let's run this and see what happens. Hmm. Huh. That's really not quite what we wanted, is it? We really want to see individual things. Yep, those are, these are, uh, I've only put inside employee test overload. What's that? Oh, an interface would still do the same thing. Now, the trick here is that the this is statically typed at compile time. And when the compiler is figuring out which method to call, it figures it out based on compile time types. So, for example, let's take a little example here with a tool in the toolbox. So I'm defining a tool, and he has two subclasses, a saw and an all. And I'm going to define a toolbox that has three add methods, add tool, add saw, add all. Let's take a look at this first one here. When I create a saw and I say toolbox, toolbox add saw, which call is going to get called? So the second one, B, right? That sounds reasonable. Okay, how about when I do it with an all? Which call is going to get called? The third one, C. So that's just fine there. Now what about this example? I say tool, tool one equals new saw, toolbox add tool one. Which one gets called? The first one's going to get called, which is the problem that we're having with the employee here. Now, the reason for that is because of the static type. We take a look at tool, whoops, 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 <laughs> let's come back up here. We take a look at the type of the parameter being passed in. We're saying, I want to call add taking a tool. It's the static type of, the static compile time type of whatever tool is. It doesn't care what it's really pointing to at runtime. Method resolution has two steps to it. First of all, which signature is most appropriate? And that happens at compile time. Then we deal with overriding, which happens in our runtime hierarchy. Once we have the right signature, we look at runtime to see what level of the hierarchy we call things. So at compile time, we're making a note saying this add method wants to call saw. What's the most appropriate? Oh, add saw. So it puts into the, the compiled code, add saw should be called there. Then at runtime, it's going to take a look at, okay, I'm calling it on toolbox. Let's see where toolbox is in my hierarchy and see what the lowest version, the closest to me version of add saw is and call that. But it's always going to call an add saw method. Similar here, add all. This one, add tool. This one, add tool. And it doesn't matter that you've overridden this guy, sorry, overloaded this guy. The signature has been locked down. And that's the problem there. And it worked the same way in C++. So what we need to do to make this work is override test overload in all of our subclasses so that we can get the proper resolution of that this variable and then the right methods will be called. So let's take a look at step four. So let's look at our CEO, employee, manager, and VP. Whoops and worker. So here's my worker, test overload, overload test foo. VP, test overload, overload foo, uh, overload test foo. Manager, overload test foo. Employee, overload test foo. CEO, overload test foo. Ew. But let's see if it works. Oops, I wanted to run the overload test. Overload test, by the way, has the exact same code it did before. And there we go. So that worked. We got the right method resolution this time.
Yes. So yeah, this would actually be something that if you had in, in the either an interface or an ab abstract class that had an abstract method, then in order for somebody to have new called on him, you have to have implemented all the methods. Okay, so and that's the right thing I did there. So let's make this a little bit more abstract. Let's define, instead of having those static test calls be called inside overload test, let's create an interface with those guys that we can pass in. I'm just going to call this tester. So what we see here is tester now has those foo methods instead of putting them in overload test. And so overload test just becomes that little main. And I'm going to call test overload passing in the tester instead of just calling test overload with nothing. Now in each of those levels, if I look at CEO, employee, composite employee, manager, VP, and worker, let's look at employee first. He has test overload passing in a tester, and we just call tester.foo. Now, what's the advantage of doing this versus having those static methods that I was calling? So instead of having this test overload called overload test.foo, now I'm calling foo on this tester that's passed in. What advantage do I get here? I can change it, right? I can pass in different things to do, just like we did with that strategy before. So once again, this becomes whoops. Once again, this becomes a strategy where I'm passing in the what to do. Other than that, everything else stays exactly the same. So in my overload test, when I run this guy, well, let's take a look at a concrete tester here. Here's a concrete implementation of the tester. He just has all those methods. I just moved them in here from overload test. And so now if I run my overload test, boom, I get the same results. But now I can change it to pass in something else. I can once again create a you're fired situation for this, right? So same compile time resolution happening here, but now I've made it a little bit more abstract. So this structure is known as the visitor pattern. We're passing in something to do and walking through the hierarchy to call that something to do, that strategy there. Okay, We overload very me various methods inside that something to do to separate out the logic. So instead of having that big if statement, we now have separate methods. Make sense? Okay. So what we usually do in Visitor, though, is put some common naming conventions on things. So the interface will call something, something, something visitor. That method that was the uh, foo method, we'll call accept. So we're going to accept the visitor. We say, hey, data structure, please accept the visitor. Note that he just turns around and calls visit this. That's all he does, just like we did inside that previous example where we called foo passing in this. So visitor has the visit methods. Each individual data class has accept methods. This has to be in every type in your hierarchy, or it won't work. Now, let's take a look at what this looks like from a sequence diagram point of view. Well, first of all, let's discuss it. <laughs> um, the idea here is something called double dispatch. And what we're going to do is we're going to say, hey, data structure, here's something I'd like you to call. We ask it to accept that. Data structure, please call it back and tell me who you are by passing in this. So the data structure is going to call your visit method in order to do things. So instead of there being a direct single call, there's two calls. There's a please call me call up front. I call you, you call me back. That's called double dispatch. And it's really, really gross. Okay. But the thing is, and whenever I taught design patterns at, at Hopkins, I'd always make a real big point. This is gross, but you need to know it because you're going to see this all over the place. Lots of people use it and they think for some reason they have to do things this way. And it's just really, really gross. But it works. It's just kind of hard to describe. And it's, it's, it's 
hard to implement. There's just a lot of code flying around there. And there's a lot of badness I'm going to tell you about in a minute here. Um, this approach that I've, I've been talking you through, going from composite, kind of leading right into visitor, is probably the best approach I've seen so far to work you into it. You know, using composite as a pattern before this, as opposed to just trying to talk about visitor in a vacuum, makes this so much easier to understand. So now sequence diagram wise, you have some caller here who wants to interact with this data object. He's going to create an instance of the visitor that he wants. He's then going to call accept on that data object, passing in that visitor he just created. The data object is going to turn around and call visit on that visitor which is going to resolve it, because he's passing in this, to be the right method. Then the data object is going to turn around and say, for each of my children, call accept, passing the same visitor in. In which case, they'll come around and call visit and so on, and the thing just recurses on and on and on for all my children. Okay, make sense? So, let's switch this over to use visitor naming conventions to start with. So first of all, I have employee visitor is my interface. He has a bunch of visit methods, one for each class in my hierarchy. I'm going to have a concrete visitor, which describes what to do when each of these nodes is visited. For this particular example, I'm just going to say something was called, just so we can see that we're walking through the hierarchy appropriately. We're going to have in our employee an accept method passing in employee visitor, visit this. And then in our composite employee, we're going to have a, whoops, here's our accept method down here, passing in visitor, visit this. Exact same code. Now you're going to see this exact same code in every single class here. So if I take a look at my VP, my worker, my CEO, and my manager, every one of those has this exact same accept method. which I, personally I hate that. I think it's really, really gross. Okay, But that's the way the pattern works, and it does work. The problem, one of the problems is, what if you forget to put an accept method in one of these guys? Then you're going to get whatever your superclass implementation is, which probably is not what you want, because you're going to get the this passed in, and it's going to resolve to the wrong type. Okay, So let's take a look at the app in here. Actually, the visitor test. No, I wanted the app. Did I, did I change that in the app yet? No, it's still using report processor. It's in the visitor test. So the visitor test is just going to say, I'm going to take try out each of these guys and see what happens. So let's run him. And we'll see that for each of those, it works fine with the visitor. Okay. Now there's a little problem with this implementation. We don't have each of our managers asking to walk the children. So right now, this will work if I pass it a single element, but it won't work for the tree. That's my next step. I'm going to visit my children. So now let's take a look at my composite employee, who's changed a little bit here. I've added in a new protected method here called accept children. And you don't have to call it that. This isn't actually part of the visitor pattern. That's just a nice little putting it all together. But the visitor pattern says that if you're a composite, you have to call accept on your children. So I'm just making a common method that we can easily call from every one of my subclasses. So any subclass that is an instance of the composite has to have this accept children inside of it. So it's going to look like visitor visit this, accept children. So let's take a look at my CEO, my manager, my VP, and my worker. So my worker, you'll notice, doesn't call that, that accept children because he has no children. My VP does, my manager does, and my CEO does. So now that we've got that set up in there, we can actually use the application with the full tree example. We're going to create an instance of our visitor, 
and then call accept passing the visitor in. And we'll see that the order in which things get called here is the same as when we were generating that report before. So let's generate the report using a visitor this time. We'll see in my application I'm calling report visitor, which is a different implementation of visitor. I'm going to call accept, and I'm going to ask that visitor to get my report. So let's look at the report visitor here. Notice that these two methods, I have them in there, but they really should never get called because they're abstract classes. Now because of that, I really don't need them in the visitor interface. I just happen to have them from before just so we could walk through the example as we were doing it. But normally you wouldn't put abstract classes in the actual visitor interface itself. Just keep that in mind. So here's my report. And then at each level, for the manager, I'm going to print out his name managing, VP vicing, CEO telling you're holding it wrong, and worker doing the actual work. So I've got that nice separation going on there now. And let's see what happens if we run this. Boom. So we're getting the same stuff we did before, delegating down through our hierarchy, passing in this visitor guy, and we don't have that if-then statement. So it's a little bit nicer that way. Now visitors don't have to have just a single method called visit. You could have groups of methods. It's very common to see a pre-visit and a post-visit, where at the beginning, you know, before you handle your children, we do the pre, then we handle our children, then we do the post. So you'll see things typically like that. Except is basically a template method. So we can put multiple hook calls inside of there to do things and have that structure manage the data structure, so walk the data structure a certain way, but then call hooks to do our processing at certain spots. So let's, let's re-implement our indentation now using this approach. So what I've done here in employee visitor, whoops, report visitor. No, employee visitor is what I want, didn't I? Oh, it might help if I'm looking at the right package, huh? There we go. Employee visitor. So now employee visitor, I, in this particular example, I got rid of the abstract classes, so they're not there anymore. But I now have, for each type, I have three visit methods, a pre-visit, a visit, and a post-visit. Now what I'm going to use these for to do my indentation is I'm going to have my pre-visit write out the information about so-and-so managing or so-and-so vicing or that type of thing. I'm going to have my visit increase my indentation. And that call is going to happen before I work with my children. And then my post-visit is going to decrease my indentation. So let's take a look at our report visitor now. He keeps track of two variables, report and the current indentation. Pre-visit for each of these is always just going to be printing out the report information because I want to do that before I do anything else. Visit increases my indentation, so I just stick some more data on there, and post visit decreases my indentation. Now the call for these guys is going to be in my composite employee here. My composite employee has accept children. Employee defines accept as abstract, which is going to force me to implement it in everybody. And let's take a look at CEO. Ooh, this is getting grosser by the second, isn't it? Visitor, pre-visit, visitor, visit, accept children, visitor, post-visit. And guess what? Every concrete class is going to look exactly the same as that. If you forget to put it in one spot, you're really hosed. Now let's take a look at worker. Worker doesn't have the accept children, but he still has the pre-visit, visit, and post-visit. Pretty gross. But it becomes pretty effective because now when I run my app, he's going to be using his report visitor the same as before. Now we see our indentation take effect. OK. 
Okay. Now, a lot of times you'll see things like the pre-visit and post-visit used to manage a transaction. So maybe start a transaction, do some stuff, end a transaction. And the start and end have to be around the do some stuff and the children walk. So that way you can start and end transactions automatically. That's one of the more common things you'll see it used for. So let's talk about some problems with the visitor pattern. First of all, you have to have a method for each type in your hierarchy. Repeated code in every one of your accept methods as you walk through your hierarchy, that same code. Very, very easy to miss when you're, when you're doing maintenance. Very, it very much falls against the do not repeat yourself because you have to repeat yourself in order to get the proper resolution of that this variable. That's one of the big problems. And even worse, and this is, this is I think, the biggest problem with visitor. Anytime you add a new type, you have to add new methods to that interface. Anytime you add new methods to that interface, you break any existing implementations, which is especially bad as if you're a third-party library and somebody else is visiting your data. Okay. Quite often to get around this, you'll see a something, something, something visitor to, which adds the new methods, and this extends the existing visitor. So that way somebody who's implementing the existing one won't break. Of course, the problem is if there's new data, they're just not going to work. <laughs> so it's kind of like, a, eh, it didn't really help us a whole lot there. At least I didn't make their, their code break at compile time. But honestly, I think I'd rather break at compile time so that I know I have to change something. Other problem with this, it's pretty much all or nothing. You can't mix and match types. Everything is in that one inner implementation. You can't say, oh, for this, I want to use a different implementation out of a jar to handle employee or to handle worker or to handle CEO. Okay. If we think about that registration idea, it's much better because now you can contribute these handlers from different places. And of course, I think the bigger problem, one of the big problems here is visitor is just hard to learn. I remember when I was first trying to learn this, I was reading the design pattern book by the Gang of Four, Gamma Helm, Velicities, and Johnson. And when I was reading this pattern, trying to figure it out, my nose hit the page of that book no less than 30 times. I mean, I'm reading through it, and this book, if you have insomnia, it's a great book to read. It really helps. It's dry. It's, it's a reference manual. If you want a good design pattern book, Head First Design Patterns is great. It's a really funny book. And I was thinking of writing one myself. When that book came out, I'm like, damn it, they wrote my book. Because it really feels like the way I would have written something. I, I, I want to have fun with it. Um, but it's a great book. That one's a good one to learn patterns from. The original design pattern book is a good reference book. It's really hard to learn from, though, especially on a pattern like Visitor, where you're just staring at this like, what? So let's come back to that idea of the handler registry. Much more flexible way of contributing registers from anywhere you want to. So let's see which one was, that's the one I want. So I'm going to start by taking a look at this report processor here. Now you could call this visitor if you want. I would avoid using the word visitor if you're dealing with a registry situation because as soon as you put the word visitor in there, people have a certain idea in their head of what's going to happen flow wise. So I would call it something else. In this case, I'm going back to the processor idea. So this report processor, remember this is the one that I had that big if statement before. Instead of that if statement, I'm going to define a little interface inside of me called handler. And he has a handle method that takes an employee. Now if you really wanted to go out, you could put generics in it so that it you know, takes the proper type as far as the parameter. That's really hard to get all the pieces right. Generics are a bit of a pain in Java at times. But it would give you some more type safety and you wouldn't have to do a cast. But you know, I'm not going to bother with that for now. We're going to keep track of a registry, which is just a map from class type to handler. And then I'm going to have a register method here. It's a static method. It could be an instance method. So if you wanted to, you could say, I'm going to create a processor and let anybody register for that one processor. Or in this case, I'm saying for all report processor instances, I'm registering the same ones. So up to you in design decision which way you want to go there. I'm keeping it simple, just having it be a top level uh, static on this. 
So all he does is take in a class and a handler and stick it in the registry. For this example, I am registering how to handle these things inside the report processor. And I'm using lambdas for this just to keep things nice and simple. Uh, so I say registry put for the CEO, I'm going to say when I have that employee, I'm just going to say telling people you're holding it wrong. For the VP, I'm vicing. For manager, I'm managing. For worker, I'm doing the actual work. Uh, you, if you wanted to get data out of it specific to different types, you'd have to cast this guy to your specific types because I have that parameter coming in. Yes? Um, yeah, if you wanted to, you could have a method somewhere and just have this call the method. This is just any whatever code you want. Or if you wanted to have multiple uh, statements inside there, you could just put curly braces around there. And then put multiple statements inside the curly braces. And why is that not working? force me to do that? Huh, I don't know why that's not working for me right now. Oh, it's inside there. I have to say return. There we go. So it could be a sequence of statements. Now, if you want to know more about lambdas, if you go to javadude.com slash articles, I have a, a video talk I gave on lambdas and streams, and that'll, that'll give you more details on that. Okay, so this allows me to register here, but I could have other pieces of code that do that registry as well. So somebody could put a new jar in the system, and when that jar has some initializer run, he calls registry put to put things in my registry for me. Well, not registry put, he calls register. You know, really, over here, I should have said register, right? I should use my methods the same way that other people would use them. Kind of like that. Ends up doing the same thing, okay? But that's a little bit cleaner. So somebody else could register as well. Now, if we were putting this in some kind of container, like let's say Spring, then what I could do is create an instance of my report processor that Spring manages, and everybody else could use that instance to contribute things to it. So that's another way we could look at this. Okay, I'm going to undo these just so that I don't have to check that back in right now. So now I have my report and my indentation, and I have a pre-process and a post-process method here. I'm just going to say report is indent plus employee get name. In, for my, I'm going to find out which handler I want. So I'm going to look that up. And then I'm going to call handler handle. Boom, stick that on there. For process and post-process, I'm going to do my indentation and my de-indentation like I did before. Okay, and let's uh, let me get all the way out of this. So, oops, what did I save in there? Oh. There we go. So in the employee, I have my abstract use processor, right? In my composite employee, I have my use processor, which says pre-process, process, stream, post-process. Actually, hold on. Yeah, that's right. So pre-process, process, post-process, post and such like that. Note that my CEO doesn't have a process method now. I don't need that this resolution anymore because I'm using runtime type identification. My VP and my manager, same thing. My worker, you know, actually, I could just move this up into employee, right? So that could be my default for employee and then override it for that, and then I don't need to have it in Worker, right? Because this doesn't really matter what the type is at compile time anymore. It's all done at runtime. So now if I look at my, my app here, I'm going to create my report processor. He's going to register his handlers. I'm going to call use processor, and then get the report. So if I run that now, boom, everything works out just fine. And now, whoops, <laughs> I don't have a slide to say it, but now things are a lot more flexible, right? It's like that container diagram that I showed you where you have different jars contributing data, contributing handlers for that data. Gives you a lot more flexibility in your system that way.
and it's a little simpler, right? I don't have to worry about having that same do it, you know, that same code repeated in umpteen classes, right? And the consequences of forgetting to put it in umpteen places, right? I just have it in the one place, which is nice because we don't want to repeat ourselves. We want to say something once and be done with it. I think this is a little easier to describe to people. You know, walking through the composite patterns a lot simpler, and it doesn't have that double dispatch to worry about there. So you get a lot of the wrinkles going out of the way. You get a lot more flexibility coming out of it. Okay. But keep in mind, you have to understand how Visitor works because people are going to blindly use it. I just had somebody the other day sent me a note. He was in my design pattern class. He sent me a note saying, oh, good God, they're forcing me to use Visitor. How do I talk them out of it? And so I tried to give him some arguments and things like that. Um, the problem is somebody there read an article that said how to do Visitor, and they've seen Visitor. They just assume that you have to do it that way. Um, and this just causes all sorts of grief. Now, one of his concerns was performance because in C++, you introduce a V table whenever, whenever you have those uh, uh, virtual methods. Um, this also is going to have the same performance thing, right? Because you have to do that lookup in the map, regardless of how you do it. Um, but I'm not quite as worried as the, on the performance of this guy. I mean, if, if you're that worried on performance, you should probably figure out some different way of doing things. You know, maybe, you know, use something a little bit more direct. Maybe hardwire the what to do in each of your classes if, if you have to. But nowadays, I don't think we're that worried about performance for those types of things. Um, it really depends on what you're doing, right? Okay. That's about all I have. Any questions? Boy, I love it when it times out to exactly an hour like that. Well, you know, five minutes shy of an hour, but, you know, works out well. Okay. So I will be rendering this video and posting it to my website shortly. It should be over the next couple days. Um, but if you go to javadude.com slash articles slash patterns, the video will be there, and I'll have a link to the source code as well. Thanks for coming.